Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce you here for this uh, presentation by Terry Chapin. He comes to us from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, Terry has been uh, reasonably active professionally. Uh, uh, he's uh, published something over 300 papers that have been cited over 27,000 times. Uh, just, to, just to be clear, that makes him one of the most cited scientists in the world. Uh, nine or ten books, a couple of which we use here at Dartmouth College, a brand new one related to the to his topic today that I'll bet will be in use in a, a Dartmouth course any time now. Uh, he's made seminal contributions to plant physiological ecology, nutrition of plants, plant defense theory, community ecology, succession theory among those topics, ecosystem science, and now Terry is showing us the way in uh, this thing uh, we call sustainability science. Uh, and his work in developing an IGERT program on that topic in Alaska has been a powerful role model for uh, the, one, the one that we're developing here. And, uh, oh, let's see, he's a, a pretty hot fiddle player. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and there's some other stuff like that, too. Uh, but for a couple hundred people, probably, uh, Terry has been a very, very important person as a uh, role model and, and mentor. Uh, I count myself to be among those. I've been doing a poll among many of those people over the years, and uh, as, so far as any of us can tell, no one has ever had a conversation with Terry that he ended. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's, tru it's, it's tru tru truly amazing. We just don't know how he does that on top of all, all that other stuff, too. And Terry, please. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. It's really exciting to be here. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to talk to all of the Eigert folks today. You, you guys have an amazing program here, an amazing group of scholars. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to visit with you. So today what I'd like to talk about is sustainability science and uh, how we think about sustainability in the context of uh, a rapidly changing world. One of the things that's really striking about so many things in the world today is that they're changing rapidly and that they're changing in a very directional way. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that's striking about this set of diagrams is that they all show basically the same pattern, directional changes in, in each of these measurements. And then in addition that there's been a huge acceleration since about 1950. And if we look at the general categories of these of things here, there are various uh, drivers of most of the processes that are important at a global scale. There are uh, changes in the way in which uh, social and ecological systems work, and changes in uh, a variety of, of other parameters, the resource use, uh, major disasters, our, our exploitation of resources. So many of the things that we care about as a society or things that we might care about as ecologists are changing in some very, very fundamental ways. So this has some important implications for sustainability. So if, we, if, if the world were, uh, usually when we think about sustainability, um, we think of it as in the situation where the future will be very much like the past. And so in this sort of a con, con construct, sustainability is really a pretty straightforward concept. If you just keep things going on track the way they have been in the past, then you've got a sustainable trajectory for the future. But how in the world do you think about sustainability when the world's directionally changing? It's clear that we can't keep things the way they have been in the past. Things are changing and will continue to change. So how do we think about sustainably managing ecosystems or uh, maintaining a, a, a sustainable trajectory for society under these conditions. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Now, if we think about this in the long-term context of the last 100,000 years up to the present, these are the changes in temperature, 
here on this axis that have occurred over that period of time. And there's, to me, the most interesting thing about this graph is that over the last 10,000 years, the climate has been incredibly stable. This is the period of time since agriculture began, since all of the great civilizations were formed. This is the time when, when societies all around the world have made, have made major changes, major developments in the sort of things that we think of as perhaps great advances in societies. And yet if we look at temperature now, we're moving outside of that stability domain pretty substantially. What's likely to happen to uh, societal systems, to ecosystems, if we move outside of this stability domain? So if we're undertaking activities that are modifying the climate systems in, in ways that it might uh, change from its, its recent patterns, we're, we're really messing with things at, at, a, at a scale that could have huge societal implications. And we don't really fully understand the consequences of the changes that, um, we're, um, that we're causing. So uh, we're not only changing climate. These, uh, this figure shows some of the changes that are happening in a variety of different things that are likely to be important to society. So each of these uh, spokes on this wheel represents a way in which society is modifying uh, things at global scales. And uh, a group of scientists had guessed at what would be a safe limit to uh, the changes where society could maintain a more or less uh, comfortable relationship with the biosphere. Uh, and if we were to exceed these limits, uh, of, then we might be uh, causing serious changes that might change the, the way in which the Earth system functions. And so we can see that for several of these things, such as uh, nitrogen flow, the loss of biodiversity, uh, the rate of climate change, we're exceeding uh, the limits of what many scientists would view as uh, causing serious changes in the Earth system. So in the case of, of biodiversity loss, uh, the rates of extinction are probably between 100 and 1,000 fold higher than they were prehistorically. In the case of nitrogen flows, the total uh, inputs of nitrogen to the world's ecosystems are twice what they were uh, as a, uh, prehistorically as a result of, of human inputs of nitrogen in the form of fertilizers and combustion of fossil fuels. And climate change is another thing that's uh, really pushing the envelope of uh, the safe ranges of uh, a, a, a stable situation for society. And we're pushing the, the, we're approaching limits on several other things as well. So I think we're, human activities are modifying the Earth system in ways that are changing directionally and which have potentially massive implications for the functioning of the global system. So what I'd like to talk about today is, some, is just to discuss how this plays out in Alaska. Ala Many of these changes that are happening are particularly pronounced at high latitudes. And so Alaska is one of those places that's warming as rapidly as almost any place on the planet. So if you want to understand some of the ecological and societal implications of this, that's a good place to, to think about it. And the, these are the changes in temperature that we've seen uh, over the historical record in Alaska and uh, for uh, spring temperatures. And then these are the changes that are projected for the rest of this century. And one of, you, one of the things you can see is the temperature is highly variable year to year. But it, despite this variability, we can see a clear trend since the, the 1970s. And that this trend is projected to continue regardless of the, uh, the differences and assumptions made by different climate models. Uh, so the way that this comes home to me is that if I look at what the, the, the average temperatures are likely to be uh, in the middle of the century, that's uh, the, the temperatures that we or our, grand, or our children are likely to experience, 
the average temperatures are going to be as warm as the warmest temperatures we've experienced historically. By the end of the century, the coolest temperatures are going to be similar to the warmest temperatures that we've experienced historically. So that, that gives you a, you all have a sense of what a cool year is versus a warm year. And if, we're, if the years that we're going to be experiencing in the future are likely to be that much warmer than what we experience currently, that has really important implications. And I think each of us has a sense for what that means to us personally and for what it means to the uh, to various ecosystem processes that we might observe around us. So this has had effects in Alaska. And I just want to show you some pictures of some of these. So in places where um, one of the effects has been the drying up of lakes in many parts of Alaska. So you can see that if you look at the photograph of any aerial photograph of any particular lakes, they've gotten smaller through time because we've had warmer temperatures, more evaporation, and not much change in precipitation. In other places where there's ice-rich permafrost, this is permafrost has thawed. So this is a picture of what you see when you uh, leave the Fairbanks airport and fly south from Fairbanks. Uh, you see places where birch forests have changed into wetlands. There's places in southern Alaska where there have been massive insect outbreaks. This is on the Kenai Peninsula with in, uh, bark beetle outbreaks. Incidentally, uh, almost all of the tree species in interior Alaska are undergoing insect outbreaks that were not present a decade ago. Forest fires are becoming more extensive than they were in the past. And so if we look at the, at a, at the historical record of forest fires and the projected changes, the historical record, uh, there's partly a, a record that where, where the aerial extent of forest, which should be written out here, is, has been measured. And then that's been uh, reconstructed through time through using stand age reconstructions. And then the projections are based on fire models that uh, uh, are associated with the changes in temperature that you saw earlier. And if we use the same sort of metrics of what's likely to happen mid-century in terms of average uh, area burned compared, that's going to be similar to the area burned in the most extreme years in the historical record. And by the end of the century, those years that have relatively low area burned are going to be similar to those years where that are extremely high at present. So this suggests a massive change in fire regime for interior Alaska. Again, I apologize for lack of axes here. But uh, this shows the, the historical changes in the abundance of spruce and the abundance of deciduous forests in interior Alaska. This is using a, 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 a forest vegetation model that's been developed by Scott Rupp. And what the, his projections are that as a result of changes in fire regime, there'll be a large decrease in the abundance of spruce forest and an increase in the abundance of deciduous forest. So when we think about the boreal forest, we think of this as being a conifer-dominated biome. This is a biome where con conifer trees like spruce uh, are the predominant feature of the landscape. According to these projections, that will no longer be the case. And this is 1970, so that's this, this switchover might be is likely to be occurring within our lifetimes. So here's a biome that's undergoing major structural change and likely to do it uh, quite rapidly. So what I've told you then is that the ecology of Alaska is changing rapidly and it's projected to change even more dramatically uh, on time scales that we and our children are going to experience. This is a map that uh, my wife pointed out to me that uh, pointed out to me the similarity of these two maps. And what it shows is that if you look at the distribution of the ecosystems of Alaska, and if you look at the distribution of the language groups uh, or the cultures of Alaska, it's virtually identical. It's virtually the same map. What it says is that these cultures are, are extremely tightly tied to their ecology and have been for thousands of years. So if we change the ecology of Alaska, what does that mean for the cultures of Alaska? These 
These are cultures where people are still very much tied to the places where they live. I think this is one of the most serious issues with respect to climate change uh, that we face throughout many parts of the world and where it's coming, it's likely to become an increasingly important issue uh, in places like Alaska. So what do we know about climate change in terms of variability? We know that uh, ecosystems or social systems or social ecological systems uh, fluctuate uh, uh, through, uh, have certain ranges of tolerance, uh, a lower limit of tolerance, say of some environmental variables such as temperature and an upper lim limit of tolerance, and that these environmental variables or whatever driving variable may change uh, through time. And, uh, but that as long as it remains within a certain range of tolerance, that the functioning of this system is likely to persist through time. And we can, we can, we've, we can uh, withstand a certain amount of variability. But what if we get a directional change in climate, such as we are seeing with climate warming? What if climate warming becomes more variable as we're seeming with climate change? What if we're uh, experiencing situations where systems are changing in such a way that they're, perhaps they're losing species diversity and becoming less, less tolerant, less, uh, less able to tolerate a certain range of variability, which as we've seen, we're losing species diversity. Any of these things would likely have the, have the potential to shift these systems outside of their current stability domains. So if we want to think about sustainability in a context of climate change, we need to think not about staying within this stability domain, but think of ways in which we, we can uh, broaden the envelope of the stability domain, increase the adaptive capacity of this system ecologically, socially, and social ecologically if we're going to be able to meet the, uh, the, the, the changes that are likely to accompany uh, climate change. So that's, that's an interesting set of challenges, uh, no matter what our discipline of interest is. Here's a diagram that uh, shows how a, a social ecological system, and uh, I'll just call this a blue box for now, has a certain set of internal dynamics. It responds, it, this, these system dynamics may change as a result of changes in drivers. These are changes in external forces on the system. And if the system dynamics change, this has certain, a certain range of potential outcomes. The system may persist. It may change to something uh, radically different as a result of our unintended consequences. Or we may be able to actively manage this system in such a way that it changes but in a way that's uh, potentially beneficial to society. So these are uh, three potential outcomes to the system. If the system's highly resilient, it may persist in its current condition. So one of the issues then is what are, what are the factors that govern the resilience of this system to this, these perturbations that we're now seeing, these changes that I've told you about. So now let's become more explicit. So some of the changes that are happening in Alaska, for example, are a warming of climate, this is associated with a population increase, largely from immigration from outside the state, which is linked to global population, uh, as a result of both increases in ignitions and warming climate. We have more wildfires. This changes uh, a variety of different ecological variables uh, to which the system is sensitive. And uh, then there's a range of potential ways in which this ecological system can respond. And these involve learning what, something about how the system is changing and how it's projected to change in the future. Things that we might do to cope with these changes. Thinking about ways to innovate, uh, and this might be innovations that occur ecologically or socially. And things, ways in which the system might adapt, either evolutionarily, ecologically, or socially. And a lot of these the, the extent to which we can adjust and adapt to these changes in conditions depend a lot on sort of the, uh, the internal characteristics of the system and uh, the dynamics of the system. And I'm not going to go into the details of those. But the nature, but the, the basic idea is that the way in which this system responds to, to 
external forces depends a lot on these internal dynamics that we can understand as a result of studies. And there's several bodies of literature that help us with this. Studies, issues of vulnerability, which is the framework for uh, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change and most of the other climate change assessments. Uh, the resilience framework, which comes from ecology and basically deals with the, the, mag the degree of flexibility of this system that might enable it to persist. Uh, and then issues of adaptation, wh where there's a rich literature in both ecology and anthropology. And another set of issues that I think we need to begin thinking seriously about is transformability, things that may cause this system either to transform in uh, unintended uh, ways that might not be beneficial, or the ways in which we can shape changes that are inevitable in such a way that, they, um, that the system may move in, uh, uh, in a way that's uh, potentially socially desirable. So this is the system that I've been interested in for the last several years, where uh, we have changes in climate that occur globally that propagate down to changes that we experience in Alaska, as you've seen in the slides that I showed you. These alter the characteristic, the structure of ecosystems, and we talked about that, and the fire regime. And this, so I've become more and more interested in the ways this connects up with local communities. This connects with communities not only because of uh, the interactions between people and fire regime, but also because ecosystems determine uh, the abundance and availability of subsistence resources on which many rural communities in Alaska depend. This is uh, the community of Fort Yukon. It's one of the larger rural communities in Alaska. It, uh, there's no road connections, no connections to the electrical grid. People get around mainly on the river and on snow machine trails. Uh, and so people are very much connected uh, to, the, to the world around them. It's different than it used to be. Uh, in terms of the way in which people inter interact with the land. A um, hundred years ago, or even uh, 75 years ago, uh, there was a relatively uh, regular seasonal round of activities where people move from summer fish camps to uh, up, up into the mountains where they'd hunt for caribou or other places where they'd hunt for moose. And uh, so people would move around the, the around the countryside as in, at the, and so that they were able to harvest resources at appropriate times of year. And then if, if an area burned, then uh, people would ju just adjust this seasonal round and still be able to harvest resources from areas um, that were at the appropriate successional stage after fire. But now people are consolidated into permanent settlements because of compulsory schooling, because of uh, the, the luxuries of having electricity and heating and permanent housing and, and medical uh, availability of medical uh, facilities and all kinds of things that most of us would consider necessities. And so this has really changed the relationship between people and society. So now, if, or between uh, people and, and the ecosystems that surround them. Now if a fire occur occurs close to the community, that has some different kinds of ecological consequences. So, what this shows is changes in the density of animals uh, at various times after wildfire. And what you can, s and the, these are patterns that, um, that I scribbled out based on conversations with hunters in, in several different communities. And if I go to talk to fish and game biologists, they draw the same picture. So they had this, the, there's the same basic science observations from both sets of observers. And what you see is that uh, moose increase to a maximum about 15 to, th to 30 years after wildfire. And that caribou take much longer to recover because lichens, which are their winter food, take longer to recover. It takes about 80 years for the lichens to come back. So when I show this slide to, to, to wildlife managers, they emphasize the importance of maintaining wildfire as part of the natural system. It's always been, it's been part of the boreal forest for the last 6,000 years. Uh, the plants and animals are adapted to wildfire, and if you start taking wildfire out of the system, it changes to something different. So there's been a lot of uh, efforts to maintain wildfire and minimize the amount of suppression activity 
in uh, rural Alaska. Uh, when I show this slide or talk to people in the villages about this, they say, that's a generation before I can teach my kids how to hunt. That's four or five generations before anything I know about car caribou hunting can be passed on to, uh, to my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. That's this, so the opportunities for cultural disconnect when you start having these sorts of uh, gaps that could be caused by wildfire. So wildfire close to a community has a really, really different eco social impact, even, though the, even in cases where the ecological impact is identical. So this, this uh, raises some real questions about how you should manage wildfire in an environment where wildfire is inevitably going to become an become more frequent. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So I'd like to go through several different lenses in, we've, in, in which to think about how to, about sustainability in the context of large directional changes in environment. And the first approach is to reduce vulnerability. This, and as I mentioned before, this is the, the approach that's been taken in climate change assessments. Uh, and it, it's a, there, it's a, it's a rel it's it's not easy to do, but it, the concepts are relatively straightforward. You reduce the exposure to hazards and stresses that are that are uh, causing an impact, and you reduce the sensitivity of the the system of concern to these hazards and stresses. And so you might reduce exposure to hazards and stresses by re minimizing the known stresses and avoiding new stresses developing institutions to minimize uh, stresses that are beyond the control that you can uh, exert at a local level, and you manage for projected changes rather than for managing for uh, historical uh, conditions. So that, that says that conservation biology ought to have a very different view of how they, they think about sustainability uh, and conservation. In terms of reducing sensitivity, there's lots of ways that social scientists and, and natural scientists have talked about sustaining uh, and enhancing natural and social capital, the, uh, and also sustaining and enhancing components of well-being. Uh, and there's issues as, uh, adri of involving trade-offs among ecosystems and multiple s segments of societies. We could talk for an hour about any one of those uh, various ways of reducing ecological sensitivity. But there's some fairly well thought out patterns of how to do this that are often context specific and uh, appropriate, different sort of strategies are appropriate in different locations. So I would just like to show you one example of a place where we're missing some of the ecological feedbacks, some of the institutions that are needed to, in order to be able to respond appropriately. And so uh, in the case of climate change, the, the main driver is human behavior at a global scale. This causes warming at a global scale. That's particularly pronounced at high latitudes. Uh, but there's nothing that people or ecosystems at high latitudes can do. Uh, there's not a strong feedback to modify human behavior. It doesn't. In a sense, there's very little that we can do in terms of modifying our own behavior that's really going to stop climate change or reduce its rate of occurrence. It, we have to construct or develop this feedback to global human behavior. So what are some of the ways? So understanding something about the, the dynamics of the Greenland ice sheet, for example, is something where we could really connect with concerns of the residents of New York City. And this is one of the kinds of things that your IGERT program is exploring. I think that's a great way in which you people can contribute to building a feedback here that's really important. Uh, understanding changes in, well, in, in the well-being of Arctic uh, animals and residents, perhaps by telling this story convincingly, we might influence things that some people choose to do. Some people care about polar bears. Some people care about. Uh, the, the opportunities that Arctic residents have or, or may not have. So in terms of uh, adaptive capacity, one general approach is to 
just enhance the diversity of options. So maintaining diversity, whether you're talking about ecologic, uh, biodiversity, economic diver diversity, cultural diversity, all of these things sort of increase the options that you have for adjusting to an uncertain uh, but different future than what we've had in the past. Now, one of the, one of the challenges in Alaska is uh, that, uh, that many of the people in interior Alaska, there's a relatively high proportion of these people that, have, uh, that are above the poverty, below the poverty level. And so this, this is one of the, the, the economic aspects that really constrains opportunities for adapting to change. But it's not as grim as it looks because many of these people rely on their, many of their economies are actually built around <coughs> subsistence. And so they get a lot of food from the country that they don't get from the store. It's not to say that, that, that those economic conditions are not serious, but people are really good at being able to cope with, uh, with local conditions. And this shows the amount of food, uh, subsistence harvest uh, per person uh, in a variety of different communities. Each one of these bars represents a different community. And you can see that each one of these communities uh, relies on a, on a mix of different subsistence resources. And years where one subsistence resource is, is reduced, people harvest more of another one. Uh, so there's opportunities because of this diversity of, of s patterns of subsistence use uh, to be able to cope with some degree of ecological change and some degree of changes in subsistence resources in response to changes in climate. Uh, Athabascan people in interior Alaska have always, always viewed themselves on a sa as a salmon people. Uh, they've adapted to changes in technology really well. Uh, motor boats, nets, lots of things. Technology is a really good way to be able to adapt to changing conditions. They're also really proud of their ability to adapt to many of the environmental conditions that, that they're seeing. But they want to know much more clearly what's coming down the pike in terms of things that are likely to affect them. A lot of uh, enhancing adaptive capacity for adapting to the future, I think, involves various ways of, of, of social learning. Uh, and this involves broadening the problem definition beyond just climate, involves thinking not just about the past, but using scenarios of the future, and then testing understanding uh, through uh, comparative analyses and experiments. So I'm just going to show you one example of ways of one, sort, one way in which social learning has occurred and, uh, and has resulted in adaptation. This has, has to do with sharing networks. Traditionally, families uh, shared food uh, among, uh, among kin members. And uh, now, as uh, 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 Western economy has become part of these villages, uh, there's also sharing that goes on between people who don't have jobs and people that do have jobs. People that have jobs will pay for gas so that somebody else can go out and hunt. People who don't have jobs have the time to go out hunting when the, when the, when it's, when the conditions are right for hunting. And so there's a fair amount of, of sharing that goes on. And oftentimes, uh, there's 30%, in general, it seems that about 30% of the people in the village provide 70% of the food. So there's some people who are very active hunters in, the, in these communities. So the, here's a way in which a traditional, um, a traditional institution in, in this community has adapted and taken on a very different pattern. It still fulfills the same function, but, it, but the, the ground rules for this are very different than they used to be. Now for scenarios, uh, one would project with increasing wildfire, as I mentioned before, that there might be a reduction in, in caribou habitat and an increase in moose habitat. So you can figure this into projections of what might be likely to happen to subsistence resources in the future. So one of the things we've done with some of these communities is talk about some of the changes that are happening and some of the, the challenges that face them. So they face challenges in climate. They face an energy crisis in the rising cost of fuel. Uh, they uh, face challenges in terms of uh, the, uh, trying to maintain their cultural uh, 
ties to the land, their cultural identity in, in the face of a Western-oriented school system, in the face of many of the other changes that they see. And so they, the people in the communities often look at these things in a, in a look for more holistic solutions. So one of the things that we've discussed as a way of dealing with fire regime, for example, is to harvest uh, flammable fuels near the communities and use these as biofuels uh, to, for heating of public buildings. Uh, and we've done some rough calculations that's, that would show that this would be ecologically sustainable for most of the communities. It would be economically viable for most of the communities. And most of the costs of carrying out some of a program of this sort are the costs of wages, and those wages would be uh, retained locally rather than uh, being uh, going outside to, to, buy, um, to buy diesel fuel. And, but there's um, huge challenges in terms of just the, the institutional barriers of, of working out uh, these sorts of arrangements. Uh, so another aspect of increasing adaptive capacity is adapting governance to implement potential solutions. Um, and I want to give you an example here. Um, this shows, this is a map of the proportion uh, of hunts by rural residents. And the light gray is, are the places where urban residents are the, account for most of the hunts uh, in, rural lands, in rural landscapes. The, the only large town in Interior Alaska, or the only large towns here are Fairbanks, Nome, Anchorage, and Juneau. The rest of this is largely rural communities. These, the places where rural hunters uh, predominate are places where there's very few moose. These are, so in most of rural Alaska, most of the hunting is done by urban hunters. So there's various ways in which uh, policies influence the moose, the, har the moose that are harvested by communities. And if there's policies that influence this, there's, uh, there's opportunities to modify these policies in ways that might increase subsistence harvest by local communities. So we've got changes in climate, uh, fire regime, vegetation, and moose uh, that I've already talked about that are inevitably going to change, uh, change the moose abundance. But then there's predator control policies, there's fire policies, fire habitat management policies, hunting policies, and so forth, that could also influence the availability of moose to rural residents. So I'm optimistic that if we begin thinking about the various opportunities, that there are ways to manage around what seems like uh, some challenging problems. Now, just thinking about fire management, uh, the costs of, of uh, fighting fires in interior Alaska are rising mainly because of changes that have happened to Alaska from things that are happening elsewhere. We've got a rising human population because of global population rise. We've got climate change, which is due to a global, global human behavior. We've got increased costs of training because of accidents that have happened with firefighting crews in Colorado and elsewhere. And all of these things have caused the cost of firefighting to double in the last 10 years. Uh, so, what are we going to do in the terms of uh, increasing probability of fire, increasing costs of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, putting, out, putting out fires? Well, there, we could think of this as two ways in which we could maintain the resilience of two, two aspects of the system. If we were to try to maintain the same fire regime today, despite the increasing flammability of of, of, of vegetation as the climate warms, we estimate that it would require about a 20-fold increase in the cost of firefighting. Now, if you have climate warming also increasing the flammability uh, of places around Los Angeles or some place like that, and the national agencies are trying to decide whether to fight fires in Alaska or fight fires in Los Angeles, you can guess what the answer is going to be. Um, right now, 50% Approximately 50% of the budget for the Forest Service goes into fire suppression. They're very close to not being able to manage as an agency for doing anything other than suppressing fires. So we're very close to the tipping point, even with the fire regime today. So 
An alternative would be to same, maintain the same budgetary allocation to fire suppression. We just give the same proportion of money to fire suppression. But we, here we've got increasing wildfire risk. We've got rising population. So what this means is a smaller and smaller proportion of the landscape that can be uh, where, where people can be protected from wildfires. That's also likely to be an unpopular uh, trend. So the other, another option is to think, well, maybe we just need a very different kind of fire regime on the landscape than we've had historically. Maybe we shouldn't be looking to try to maintain either a, a, an economic approach or an ecological approach to maintaining to sustaining the past fire regime, but we should be actively trying to look at something different. Perhaps by uh, trying to manage fires so that we have many, many smaller fires and have a much more heterogeneous landscape than what we've had in the past. So that's different. So this, sort of, this is an example of transformation to go towards something different. Sometimes transformations happen to you rather than something that you plan on. So there are, I think there's some strategies that we could take for, for, for preparing for and navigating transformations in constructive directions. And this, this I think, is a very new way to be thinking about, uh, about sustainability. It's, it's sustainability in a very broad sense. It's sustainability by inducing change. So prepare, planning for, uh, for transformations in means in engaging stakeholders to figure out what the problem is, identifying the thresholds, where do you want to go, uh, identifying barriers, how to get there. And then I think there's ways to prepare you. Many of these things you can do in advance and be prepared for transformations, and then you look for a crisis that can be an opportunity to initiate change. Now, most of us can think of crises that of, of one scale or another that are quite likely to happen where we live or work. You, these are the things that people worry about all of the time. But if you're prepared for those crises and can think of ways in, those, in which those can be used to navigate towards some alternative state that might work better in, in a cha in a, in, in the, under future conditions, then uh, that's one way to think about things. And so this means maintaining a flexible strategy because it's not going to play out the way you think it will and being transparent so that it's not, the effort's not co-opted by some special interest group, and then fostering institutions that, uh, that draw on resilience and, um, and resources from other scales. And then we've already talked about building resilience. So just let me give you an, another example of thinking about transformations. Uh, sea ice is disappearing in the north. This threatens the, the uh, uh, not only marine mammals, but also coastal communities that depend on those marine mammals for a cultural and a nutritional resource. One of the other things that happens as the sea ice retreats is that salmon are moving north, and they're moving into rivers where they never were before. So maybe salmon are an alternative subsistence resource for, for some of these communities that have traditionally been dependent on marine mammals. So one, one conversation that could be had in communities is, what are the, what's their deepest value that they're trying to sustain? Are they trying to sustain their connections to the land and the sea, or are they trying to sustain their connections to marine mammals? So uh, perhaps we should be thinking about desi oops, designing marine reserves for a fishery that doesn't exist. Maybe we should be managing stream gravels uh, and uh, recruitment habit, uh, spawning habitat for salmon in a place where the salmon don't yet exist as we think about managing oil fields. So these are thinking about managing for transformation. Right now, there's no vested interest that would oppose setting up reserves in a place like this for, for salmon, to, to maintain salmon. Uh, and so there it would be, there's not, a, wouldn't be a lot of political opposition to something like that. So um, one of the things I've become concerned about is that this is just a snapshot of a very tiny place on our planet. Uh, and if you think about the place where you are, or the places where you grew up, or the places that you care about, I think you could probably tell a similar story. Uh, 
with different actors, different players, different drivers, but it's a, it's a situation that's playing out throughout the entire planet. We, uh, there's a very, I think we're on a trajectory of a very unfavorable relationship between society and uh, the, the biosphere, the planet on which we live, our life support system. So I think there's a really urgent need, but also some tremendous opportunities to turn around this relationship. We've never had a more supportive administration in terms of thinking about opportunities to do like this. Uh, the Stern report has shown the economic costs of climate change and shown that there are real economic advantages of, of slowing the rates of climate change now while we have a chance to do so. And there's many other ways in which, where I think there's opportunities uh, to progress at, at larger scales. And I think there's ways in which we can do this at any scale at which mo we might be interested in, in studying or taking action, whether these are local, uh, regional, or larger scales. So Alaska is a place that's vulnerable to climate change. It has some really important sources of resilience, and many of these are in local people who you might not think of as having a lot of resources to cope with change. Uh, it, there's opportunities for transformations that can move in positive directions despite the changes that are occurring. And I think these ideas of ecological stewardship, thinking about uh, shaping the changes for the future, provide some real opportunities and some guidelines for moving in directions that we might want to go. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, or any comments, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Simon. Um, how would you define resilience, and how does that relate to biodiversity being resilient? I would define resilience as the capacity of a system to uh, to uh, to to minimize the impacts of of perturbations and shocks to a system so that it continue to maintain its more or less normal functions despite these perturbations. And so basically, how can a system be flexible and be able to adjust in response to, ch to changes and perturbations? So one of the things that biodiversity can do is just to increase the number of options that are available. It can increase the uh, uh, the number of species that can may be able to deal with different kinds of conditions under a changing climate with different sorts of disturbance regimes. Uh, it, um, so it, uh, that's, that's a way in which biodiversity can be really important to ecological resilience. And I think uh, economic diversity plays exactly the same role in terms of, e of local economies. Alaska, for example, is has 90% of its uh, state revenue coming from one industry. And it's not very likely to be resilient to changes in the energy in industry. So I think diversity plays out in many different ways that, that are, are logical in, in a very, in a very gen general sense. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could, um, if you had any thoughts on whether or not uh, rapid climate change or rapid warming will reduce the already limited acceptance of traditional ecological knowledge of Alaska Native communities, or what that has in store for the future of the integration of Alaska Natives into uh, discussions of climate change or climate science. I think Alaska Native culture has a huge opportunity to contribute to uh, to solutions, uh, to adapt adaptive solutions. For one thing, uh, one of the defining characteristics for me is that it's a very holistic perspective. It's not stovepiped into uh, energy issues, ecological issues, uh, cultural issues. It's all part of the same thing. And I think that's the solution that we face with uh, the changes that are happening globally and nationally is it's a, it's a, a set of, a suite of interrelated problems. And I think 
a lot of the solutions are going to be grappling with these problems in a holistic way. And so I think just the general philosophy and approach of uh, uh, Alaska Natives to, the, to their lives uh, is a lesson that we can learn from. And then in terms of specifics, they've got the best observation network available in Alaska on the sorts of ecological conditions that society compares about, uh, cares about most strongly. So they've just, they're just as a result of, of being long-term observers on the land. For example, uh, they, saw, they, they were the, uh, Alaska Natives were the ones to point out that the landscape is drying before anybody knows, noticed on satellite images. They're the ones to talk about increased parasitism of salmon. And I could go on and on and give you a list of, of dozens of examples where they've been the real, the real, the observers of, that are on the, the, the front lines of climate change and seeing it happen and, and reporting it. So I think there's wonderful opportunities there for a, for a constructive dialogue. That's not the way it's happened in the past. Yes? Um, so I really like your the, um, idea that we can't really try to keep things the way they are, and we have to be very adaptable to it. And, and your example about people looking for um, sea mammals and maybe switching on to salmon that are moving into the area, what that sort of brings to my mind, though, is one of it may be not possible to actually plan for what you want to do because everything's opportunities. So, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about um, actually planning something for the future and then implementing those kinds of plans? Because it seems like a lot of what you're talking about is being adaptable and responding to whatever happens. That's it's, right. It means you can't plan for what you should be doing, except to go, we know we're going to have to do something, we're going to have to change, and basically that's as much as you can say about it. In a sense, that's what we do every day. Uh, we never know what's going to happen next day. Each of us as individuals or as, as larger units never know what's happening. So we're, we're always adjusting to, to surprises. Now, I think through climate change science, we can identify some of the very likely trajectories that are going to happen. And we can, we can use those trajectories of, of expected change as, as our targets for, for what we, could, we might expect, rather than our experience with what's happened in the past. So I think there's some, some ways in which scientific tools can, can help us um, adapt. We certainly won't be able to predict or expect all of the surprises that are coming, but we've never been able to do that in the past either. And so, so I, I think I think there's ways in which we can we can adjust. We just need to be aware that we need to be flexible and having our ide eyes on the future. It also might be a good time to point out that adaptation to future change and mitigation of rates of change are two parts of the same problem. Uh, the more we can reduce the rates of climate change, uh, the less extreme will be the changes that will occur in the future. And so I think as long as we think of the, uh, two, those being two parts of the same issue, then I think uh, we can begin to move forward if, if society can begin to take this problem seriously. Yes? Um, thank you so much for your talk. Really, it was really interesting, and I have so many questions. I'm recording so um, And uh, so I study climate change, and I'm looking at, to some extent at these recent, re relatively recent climate changes, such as the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. And one of the most striking things I saw in your talk was that the map that you showed between the vegetation and the native people in Alaska um, and how those are so similar. And I would assume that during the recent medieval warm period in the Little Ice Age that those vegetation patterns in Alaska and, and as a result, the people must have changed. And I was wondering if there's, if there's any sort of um, uh, local history passed down through people about how people have adapted to those changes in the past, because they're recent. They're, you know, 150 years ago to 1,000 years ago. So there are definitely people. There is that. some oral history. For example, there used to be bison in interior Alaska when it was colder. And the last 
bison remains are about 150 years ago. And so there's some oral history of using bison in, in some places. So there are some bits of oral history, but not very much. One of the things that's really surprised me and that I don't really understand is that the fire regime has been incredibly constant for the last 6,000 years. It's highly variable year to year, but uh, you don't see a really striking pattern that pulls the Little Ice Age out as being radically different uh, in terms of uh, fire regime. And I would suspect that that would imply that at least the types of forest cover would have been similar through the Little Ice Age. Okay, I have one question about that then. On your plot that showed the deciduous trees versus the spruce, right. there, was, there was a crossover that was projected to happen in the future, but there was also a crossover in the past that was like pre-1990. And there was a, a big increase to, to, there was a trend in the past that I didn't understand. Oh, that's a good point. I, 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 that may well be related to, to Little Ice Age. That's a very good point. Yeah, you might, I, that's a very good point. You're probably right about that. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, sir.